I'm Webb Ebel here. I finished the war with the 445th Bomb Group, and shortly after we got started, uh, I became a lead pilot, and of course that made the crew a lead crew during the war as we finished our 30 missions. Well, this was at Randolph Field while I was going through the second phase of my flight training. It was December of 1941. This was taken at Blytheville, Arkansas, a twin-engine advanced flying school. I was an instructor there for one year. I think this was a AT-9, the engine that you see behind me in the picture. Pictures taken in front of the Nissan hut in which my crew and I lived. Um, this was with the 445th Bomb Group, and it was at Tibbenham, England. Picture was taken shortly after the uh, crew was assembled, and it was taken in El Paso, Texas. The crew members, the guy with the cigar is Don Whitefield, navigator, uh, Art Kugel, bombardier, myself, Bill B. Hart, uh, co-pilot. John Hubitz, tail gunner. Willis Duvall, gunner. Joe Scomro, uh, aerial engineer. Bob Sims, radio. Haig Mesrobian Ball Turret Gunner. Santos Cabral, Waste Gunner. This was taken in Tulsa, Oklahoma in my primary flight school, and it was taken probably in October of 1941. Okay. This is a set of the pilot's briefing notes, which were passed out to us as we were being briefed for that day's mission. Uh, in this particular set, which was on the 27th of September, 44, I was deputy lead for the, uh, for the group. There were four squadrons in this group, and I was flying on the right wing of the lead ship. This raid was at Kassel, Germany on the 27th of September, 44. Uh, this sheet has the second two, no, the last two squadrons in the group uh, and positions of the various aircraft within the formation. Tell me how old you were and where you were living when you entered the service. Uh, I was about 26 years old, having graduated from the University of Alabama. I was living in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and about to go into the infantry uh, when I was able to pass the Air Force examination. And uh, luckily, I got into the Air Force rather than going into the infantry at that time. Tell us about your arrival in England. We went around the South Atlantic route. This was in about May of, no, about April of 44, down through West Palm Beach, Trinidad, uh, Belém in Brazil, across to Dakar in Africa, up to Marrakesh in, I believe, French West Morocco. Because of weather conditions we, in England, we were delayed there in uh, French West Morocco at Marrakech for several days. Finally flew into Valley, Wales, and from there we were escorted by, I guess, another bomber who took several of us into our field, which was at that time North Pickenham in England, and this was with the 492nd Bomb Group. Tell us about your first mission. Oh, boy. Uh, this was a brand new bomb group. We were all rookies at this business. Went through the assembly procedure, which was new and really a frightening experience for all of us, and certainly for me. 
finally got the bomb group assembled and took off on the route, our mission was uh, Mulhouse in France, which was close to the Swiss border. We were briefed to be very sure that we did not bomb into Switzerland, which was, of course was a natural uh, country that was not in the war. And uh, we wandered around several times to make sure that we didn't bomb in Switzerland. That finally was accomplished, and I think that's what contributed to me and one other from the group uh, who crashed in southern England. And very frankly, what it was, we just plain ran out of gas after that milling around down there near the French and Swiss border. We flew out across the English Channel. By the time we got to the Channel, one engine had quit on us. As we crossed the Channel, uh, other engines quit on us, quit because they were out of gas. We threw equipment around the way you see in the movies and all that sort of thing, trying to uh, lighten our aircraft. We went in over the English coast, I'm guessing at about 150 feet, and after we got down, I, an English aircraft crew came over and took us out of the wreckage. And I talked to the officer in charge, telling him that I had a choice to come in, as I did, and luckily got away with it. But the other choice was to make a 90-degree uh, turn and land on the coast. And he said, well, that was a very fortunate decision because that coast was all mine. And if we had gone in, that would have been the end of this gang and we wouldn't be doing this interview. <sighs> My wife and I have been back to this place where we crashed. And we all know that English fields are extremely small. This one where we landed on our belly was not small. It, it must have been a mile long. I think it was alfalfa. And we slid in, and uh, as we came to the end of our slide, we, uh, well, we sort of tore up the airplane in a couple of ditches. But fortunately, uh, no one was seriously injured. One, the radio operator was pinned in the wreck. The, here comes the British, this anti-aircraft crew, pulled that aircraft apart around this guy and got him out, took him to the hospital. So obviously we were extremely fortunate. When you got back to the base, what did you think about the rest of the missions you were going to have to fly? Scared, of course. Uh, the intensity of being frightened uh, uh, was turned up several degrees. Uh, if I would have been given some sort of an opportunity to avoid the rest of the missions, I, I think that I would have taken it. But, uh, of course, you weren't given that opportunity. And uh, I, I'm like everybody else. I, I think I flew in a state of perpetual fear. Tell us about your most dangerous mission. Well, that probably would be the one that a lot of people uh, know a lot about. This was the mission in which the 8th Air Force group took the largest loss of any mission during the war. This was at Castle, Germany, 27th of uh, September. Uh, we were after the Hermann Goring Tiger Tank Works. When we got over the target area, there was a 10 tenths cloud cover. You all heard of window or chaff, this uh, material that was thrown out of aircrafts to foul up the uh, anti-aircraft gun. And it did. I remember looking down toward the uh, overcast, undercast, and saw the flak just chewing the daylights out of nothing down there. So we weren't hit by flak at all. However, this is where the excitement comes in. You remember I was the deputy lead. The lead aircraft was taking us in by Mickey PFF radar. And he made a mistake in identifying his target. He should have gone into Castle, but he picked one that was close by, a town called Gottingen. And in doing that, he went off to the left several degrees, which gradually took our some 35 aircraft off to the left, out of the bomber stream. Yeah, we released our bomb and made a turn. 
and turned to join the bomber stream. And where was the bomber stream? We, we were out there all alone. I, I didn't see the bomber stream at all. So there were some 35 to 40 aircraft out there all alone. This was near the end of the war. We were winning. We weren't particularly concerned about it. But very shortly, John Hubis, my tail gunner, said, hey, there's a bunch of bogeys out here. OK, John, keep your eye on them and let me know. Well, the next thing I knew, I could see in front of me sights that I had never seen before, bursting of uh, guns, ammunition from these FW-190s. I'm told that there was at least 100 to 150, and I can't verify that at all. They came at us from the rear, and we knew we were in trouble. Now, some particular instances of what I saw, I was watching the lead ship. I had to. I was flying formation on it. And a FW-190 came up under that aircraft. The 190 almost stalled out and just shot the living daylights out of, those, out of that aircraft. Pretty soon, it heeled over on its left side and began to go down. I saw some men escaping. I don't know how many. Shortly after that, a, an aircraft came right over our right wing, an FW-190. Nose turret gunner fired at him like a, a garden hose at it. I don't know how much damage it did. After a while, his landing gear came down on the FW-190. He wheeled off to the left, to the right. Didn't see him anymore. About that time, the guy who was flying on my right wing, I looked over at him, and he was on fire and flying formation on me. And he would come in on me like this, and I would go down <laughs> to try to get out of his way and was successful. I think that he exploded later on, but I didn't see it. Then there was one more. An aircraft came in over, an FW-190 came in over our left wing and just sort of stood there. And he looked at us, and we looked at him, and then he peeled away. The next thing, the Cavalry came to our rescue. Four P-38s, you know, our fighters, came right over us going to the rear. And we realized at that point that probably we were safe. So OK, the lead ship was shot down. Now I'm the lead ship. What was to lead? Three other aircraft were in the air. And of course, they were from these four squadrons. And they were widely dispersed. We tried to get them in to fly formation, and whatever reason they had for not coming in, I don't know, and I certainly don't. I'm not criticizing anybody. But we went home, a ragged four airplanes, in nothing that could be called a formation. Went in over the field. Uh, one of these four had his hydraulic shot off, shot up. So he went off at the end of the runway, I think successfully. The other three of us. Uh, landed and uh, taxied into our hard stand. Uh, I had some battle damage. A uh, projectile had gone through one of my oil tanks. But by golly, this sealant that was in it sealed it. I didn't even know that I'd been hit until I got back down on the ground. One of those three aircraft that got back to their hard stand was not hit. The rest of us were gone or had sustained some sort of battle damage. When all this action was taking place, did you see any of the other planes going down behind you of the, of the group? Because I was in the front of the formation, I saw very little. The only thing that I saw is what I just described to you, these, these aircraft coming in, this one B-24 that was burning on my right. No, I did, did not see because of my position in the formation. What did? What did you feel as all this was happening? <laughs> yeah, that's a, an excellent question. What did you feel? As I said, uh, I was scared all the time. And I think I was normal and average. And was there a sense of more fear? No. And I was kind of amazed at myself and at most anybody else. How, how you're able, under fear, you were almost up-chucking because of this fear. 
Yet, by golly, you go ahead and do your job. It, it's amazing. When the crews that came back were involved in debriefing, what what happened then? Uh, of course, we went through the debriefing, and we we knew that very shortly the the group ground personnel knew that we had had this horrible disaster. And uh, they were going through our uh, barracks and taking out our personal effects. And I'm told they went into our barracks thinking we were lost at everybody else. And they were picking up our personal possessions and they were going to well, do whatever they do with personal possessions. I suppose send them back to our survivors. Uh, after the debriefing, I really don't remember many of the details of the debriefing. That apparently was fairly short. But after the debriefing, we stepped out of the room and there were several fellows, among them Jimmy Stewart, who we all know, and, uh, well, Casey, who I understand later became the group commander. But they all knew this McCoy, who was the uh, command pilot, and they knew uh, Chilton, who was the pilot of that lead plane. And of course they wanted to know, hey, what happened? Well, I. I told them substantially what I'm telling you. I, that's all I knew. What was the reaction of the personnel on the base for the next day or two or three after that? I, of course I can't speak for everybody. I, I don't know that. But yes, they were going through this business of taking personal possessions. And then uh, apparently there was a decision as to do we put up a uh, what we had for a mission the next day. Uh, Colonel Jones uh, brought me into his office and said, hey, we're going to put up what we have for a mission. Do you want to lead it? I'm no hero. <laughs> I said, no, I didn't think so. I, I'd rather my crew would stand down for the mission. And the mission the next day went to Castle, Germany. They put up a squadron. Now, also, and these were of the crews who remain, you know, we didn't all fly on every mission. Uh, then it became the problem of getting replacement, not only replacement crews, but replacement aircraft. And these were all over, I understand, at uh, Liverpool. And within 24 hours, that base was fully manned with aircraft and crews. Now, how long it took to get back into a full operation, I don't remember. But I do know that what they had went up that next day. What else do you remember about the deviation from the route that uh, helped to lead to this disaster? I'm an avid reader, and I've read among many things, anything that I could find on comments that people have had to make on this castle raid. I think the, the, the one that, it, I, I guess it disturbs me, is comments that are made by people who were in this raid who, realizing that a deviation was being made from the target to this little town of Gottingen, contacted the lead ship in, and informed them of the error, and allegedly they were told that, uh, well, words to the extent of follow me and keep your mouth shut. Uh, my Mickey operator, Jim Fleur, told everybody on board our aircraft that an error was being made. I had a command pilot on board. No effort was made by us to communicate with the lead ship. So this business of having been told that they were making an error and apparently ignoring that information, uh, that is, is, is what has disturbed me. And, and of course, I don't know the answer to it. Was he told? If he was told, what did he do about it? I don't know. All I know is that we went right into Gottingen, and I've told you this already, we dropped our bombs, made our turn, find that we were abandoned, and then these FW-190s caught us. Tell us about your next most memorable mission. I think that would be the mission to uh, 
Hamburg, Germany. Uh, as we went along, and I suppose this is true of every crew, when we started out, we were raw, we, we didn't work well together, and I suppose through our 30 missions, we probably were halfway through before we could finally begin to regard ourselves as a crew. We were assigned, I think we had the entire 8th Air Force lead on this particular mission to Hamburg, Germany. I don't remember the date. I would, it was before this castle mission, uh, though I would say it might have been our 20th mission that we flew, but I'm not sure of that. I had a, an excellent navigator, Don Whitefield, uh, who took us right into the target. I had an excellent bombardier, Art Kugel, who, when he saw that target, it was the Glindy um, Ordnance Work, I believe is what our specific target was. Good visibility. We didn't have to deviate. We, and, and why I'm saying this, we didn't throw the formation all over the sky. We went right in like an arrow, and everybody could get in and fly as close formation as they were capable of flying, right in, and uh, kind of an amazing thing. Normally, I was talking to some of my crew out here in the lobby, I think the thing that frightened all of us so much was to look at a great big cloud of flak in front of us. My God, it is it, terrifying. But in this mission that I'm talking about, because we were the first crew, the first ship in, we were leading the whole gang that day. Uh, we didn't see flack until the last minute. We were scared, but not scared to the extent as we were in other missions. So, yeah, we got right in, and uh, as far as I know, boy, Art Kugel laid those bombs right on the money. And uh, I think that we were probably at our peak of, if I can say, peak of perfection, if there was such a thing. It was on that raid to uh, Hamburg, Germany. What do you recall about the um, crew as they were working on their missions in terms of their morale? <laughs> I, I've talked to some of the fellows right here at our, our reunion we're having now. I guess they regarded me as something of a marionette. I think that's the word, you know, GI from the word go. And uh, I understand that other crews were slapping their pilot across the rear end and calling him Joe or whatever it was. But we didn't do that in my crew. I, I've got a horrible last name, and they couldn't remember to call me Evil Hair, so I was always addressed as Captain. And I didn't know how the, the guys were, were taking my attitude and my way of running a crew. But I have been reassured by a lot of these fellows who, you know, crew members, that I guess at the moment that they hated my guts probably. But uh, now that it's all over, they're expressing appreciation. They, they like that severe discipline. That was my way of doing things. But, uh, you know, what's their morale? Well, uh, in my opinion, excellent. I, I, I was very fortunate, had a good crew, officers, enlisted men, morale, excellent. What's the single thing that you remember the most about the war, if you had to pick one incident or feeling? It would be this feeling that I expressed a moment ago, and I bet Joe here got that same feeling, extreme fright, but being able to carry out your duties through all that. It, I amazed myself, and I think I'm an average guy. This is, this is what I remember most about feelings that I had. Tell me what you learned about yourself during the war. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. <sighs> that I'm just an average guy among average guys uh, doing a good job. Uh, no hero in the heroic sense. I'm very proud of it. I don't want to do it again. None of us do. 
but we're very proud of what we did and uh, just an average American trying to do his job. What has your career been since the war? Oh, well, uh, started out with a telephone company in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Stayed with them for about 15 years. They wanted me to move my family to another location. And uh, my wife and I are both from Fort Wayne. Families have been there for a couple of generations. I didn't want to move. And I told you originally that I was a, an instructor pilot for about a year before I was assigned combat duty. And uh, I, I thought that I was successful as an instructor. So when the telephone company wanted me to move, I didn't want to. So what shall I do? I went back to school, got a degree in teaching, and ended up the last 20 years of my working career teaching in the public schools in Fort Wayne, Indiana. How is, what is your impression, uh, based on your teaching experience, of today's generation's knowledge of what the Second Air Division did during World War II? God bless them. They don't know. Even my own children. I'd like to tell war stories, and I've not been uh, encouraged much by it. They knew Dad was in the war. And boy, don't take anything as being critical of these young people. They've got their problems, too. But they don't know very much about what happened. Do you think they should? Yes, but I, I don't take that as a criticism. The same way that I should know about our own civil war and the, the first world war and that sort of thing. Sure, I think a knowledge of history, being a teacher for 20 years, sure, it's, it's, it's essential. Tell me what you want the world and history to remember about your contribution to the war effort. Just a bunch of averages. <laughs>